I'm Emily Rooney. With me is Marin, who is dealing with MS. When the time comes, Marin says she'd like the option of physician-assisted suicide, but the Supreme Court says it's not her decision to make. That's next on Greater Boston. <laughs> Helping people die is something that doctors and hospitals have quietly known about orcindone for a long time, perhaps centuries. No one talked about it, no one asked about it. Only the core decision makers knew, and it was never something to celebrate. That all changed in 1990 when Michigan's Dr. Jack Kevorkian first broke news with an assisted suicide. Here's a short review from a recent Frontline program. Since 1987, Dr. Jack Kevorkian, a retired pathologist, had been promoting his services to help desperate people end their lives. He had even invented a suicide machine. He was a explosion that came out of nowhere. A feisty doc basically saying, I'm going to take on the medical establishment, I'm going to take on the legal establishment, and I'm going to do something unheard of. I'm going to assist people in dying publicly, above board, say that's what I'm going to do, and then I'm going to dare somebody to come and prosecute. In the last six years, Kevorkian had helped 27 people die. He had been charged with murder three times. Or murder. Those charges were dropped, but he was brought to trial three more times for violating a Michigan law banning assisted suicide. Each jury found him not guilty. I'm a primary care doctor. Dr. Timothy Quill of the University of Rochester Medical School has emerged as the leading physician advocating the legalization of assisted suicide. Five years earlier, just as Kevorkian was emerging, Dr. Quill had shocked the medical world writing in the New England Journal of Medicine that he had prescribed an overdose of barbiturates for a patient he called Diane, suffering from terminal leukemia. What we do for these people as a last resort also says a lot about us as a culture. If we walk away from them because it's too dangerous, that is abandonment. We have to be much more creative about how we're going to respond to them, and I think we would agree that that needs to be done. Dr. Quill, like most doctors, has been a persistent critic of Jack Kevorkian, of his judgment, his methods, and the sheer number of his cases. But deep inside many of the stories of Kevorkian's patients, Dr. Quill finds evidence of the struggle he sees at the center of this issue, the moral and ethical chasm that has opened between desperate patients and their cautious doctors over the right way to end a life. I guess I have a basic prejudice that a physician should not be involved in taking life. We can allow it to happen, but I, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, I think it's a dangerous thing when a doctor is willing to take your life, for whatever reason. You fail to understand that I said it was justified when she came to me. So why didn't you do it? Because I wanted to be sure, like every doctor should be. It took you 18 months to be sure? That's right. Why? Because, I, because everyone would agree then it's incurable Who and agree? hopeless. Anybody with sense. I think he's turned up the heat on this debate and in some ways will be remembered as the central figure who made America grapple with the question of assisted suicide and not allow them to turn away. In 1994, Oregon voters were the first to legalize physician-assisted suicide. And this spring, two separate federal appeals courts ruled that Americans had a constitutional right to that help. It's a little unclear to me. We have little information. The issue is ultimately headed to the U.S. Supreme Court. And just last week, in a 9-0 decision, the Supreme Court ruled that states are the ultimate arbiters. They can ban assisted suicide or permit it. In Massachusetts, a bill has been filed that would permit physicians to prescribe legal doses of medication to patients believed to be within six months of death. Opponents fear this might be abused by the elderly or the mentally ill. With me is Marin from Brookline, who only goes by one name, and is also has, you've had MS since 1980. What is it like living with MS? Well, there's, I, I guess, for most people, there's an uncertainty about fut uh, the future. But for living with a chronic, debilitating, progressive disease like MS, there's, that's accentuated. Um, 
So there's changes and adaptations that need to be made at every stage to the changes do, and the losses. Do you feel yourself getting weaker or sicker? Do you, do you know when you deteriorate? Only for myself, it's in looking backwards and mm -hmm. thinking, oh, I used to be able to do that. Of course, it's sl most of the time slow, and it's not rapidly progressing. Um, there are even great periods of stability. Um, what's frightening for me is seeing friends of mine who functioned at the same physical level as I did when I met them maybe 10 years ago who are either dead or unable, need 24-hour care, can't feed themselves. You're, you've been an outspoken advocate for physician-assisted suicide. You've spoken on television. You've given a lot of interviews. And you speak about a friend that you had that you saw die of MS. That's Tell right. us about her. Patricia, we're going to put a photograph up. Great. Patricia um, was a very good friend of mine who, when I met her in 1985, was Functioning, fun functioning at the same level as myself. And what happened, she had many hospitalizations, and what turned out to be her last hospitalization, I visited her in New York at the hospital. And she, it was my worst nightmare seeing it because, and seeing her, she was in a sterile, scary environment where her, she, her body had given up. Um, she was not able to do anything for herself, breathe on her, on her own, speak. Um, and the only thing that was alive in her very misshapen body were her eyes, which were so terrified. Hmm. And it was after my experience of being with her at some length in that hospital room that I vowed that my death would not be like hers. Did she want a physician-assisted suicide? I can't say, because I wasn't um, as savvy and thinking of these issues then. I, I and, and was her mind alive? I, only in the sense that I saw the terror, mm -hmm. would I infer from that that she knew what was going on, um, because she was terrified. There was no question that she was terrified. So yes, the answer to that is I would say yes. But beforehand, before she got to that point, had she ever talked about ending her life in a different way? I know she didn't want that. I know mm -hmm. she, I don't know anybody who, who want, you know, we all, I, I, well, there are very I, few good ways to die. And we although are. there are more peaceful, less frightening ways to die and less painful ways to die. And, and I feel that, um, there, that it, this is an issue of choice. It's not one of compulsion. No one should be mm -hmm. made to do whatever the, what they don't want. And when people talk of abuses of, um, and slippery slope, I mm -hmm. feel that if this were legalized, if assisted suicide were legalized, that we would have much more regulation, safeguards built in so that there would not be abuses that are happening but now. But the fact that it has been happening, I mean, we, we know anecdotally, no we know question. through research that uh, people have been performing assisted suicides for many, many, many years. Do we need a law? Well, I believe so. I believe so because I think to some degree, right now, the way it exists, it's classist, and that it's an ec that if a person has the finances, they're insured a, a better death, and that bothers me. Um, I feel that more abuses, personally, I believe that more abuses can take place when it's covert, and that you know doctors can decide with out the rigidity of a law where there are so many checks and along the way um, that a person must be terminal within six months mm -hmm. of death, um, two doctors competent, you know, a lot of different safeguards. I feel yes, we mm -hmm. do need a law. Conversely, people who have money may be prolonged in an agonizing way. I mean, it can work both ways. You can have 
the well-reported story of Jackie Onassis, right. who exactly. was put on a morphine drip in her ho own home and allowed to die in a very dignified way. But then there are people who are like Sonny Bongulo, for reasons that are a mystery to most of us, is kept alive, you know, just right. prolonged for, for no reason. And money plays into both of those, in a sense. That's an interesting point. Um, as you say, uh, the, the latter's more of a mystery. I, um, I, 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 I am an advocate for assisted suicide because I really do believe that it will only be better if people have a choice. And certainly for myself, speaking personally, I know that when I know that I have a choice over how I die, and that her fate cannot be mine, it frees me to live in, my, in the present much more fully so that I don't have this mm -hmm. overpowering fear of my future. You don't have to seek someone out. What, has, has Dr. Jack Kevorkian been a positive advocate for this issue? I am on the fence about, <laughs> that, about him. Mm -hmm. um, I started off thinking he was a champion of the cause and helping, and now I feel very much more leery and concerned that he um, may be doing more damage than good, and um, because of, you know, but, but then... Th but the only reason there is a discussion about making it a law, which you feel very ex strongly about... That's what comes up for me as well, that any maverick, any <laughs> person who's really out there is often seen as uh, crazy at the moment and a little too, you know, extreme. Have you already consulted a physician, someone who you would yes. consider as your advisor? Yes. And that person will help you only if it's legal or will they help you anyway? I feel that I have done my research such that I know, it, I'm, I don't, I'm not in assured that I will have, um, well, first of all, I'm only going to want to make, avail myself of this if, 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 and so that's an important piece. And then if it's not legal and I can't have it the way I would choose, then I do know other alternative ways of, that people learn mm -hmm. that when they, this is of importance to them. How are you feeling now? Are you, do you go to work? Do you yes, I'm a psychotherapist or? in Brookline, and I live a very full life, and I'm feeling very good. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, feeling like uh, I'm feeling strong and healthy. Mm -hmm. And yet, that specter does not go away mm -hmm. of my future. Well, we certainly hope it's a decision you're not going to have to make. But Thank good you luck so to much. you when you feel you have to. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Marin, for being with us.